so much to everyone who's joined. Uh, my name is Len Montgomery. I'm the Public Lands Campaign Director for Environment America. Um, really excited to be hosting this conversation today. So um, this uh, webinar is part of a series uh, directed at uh, state decision makers um, and folks that do organizing on the state level um, and uh, we've um, we've been doing a, a whole series on different uh, clean air, clean water, um, public lands, uh, clean energy uh, topics. So this is this is the one on forests, um, and in my opinion, the best one. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, I'm going to kick us off and just talk very briefly about uh, why why forests are important, and then uh, turn it over to my um, uh, co-presenters, uh, but wanted to just um, quickly let you know who you'll be hearing from. So um, Zach Porter uh, with Standing Trees will be uh, talking about um, actions on uh, that we can take on the state level around uh, United States forests. Uh, Jennifer Skeen with uh, NRDC will be talking about um, uh, northern northern forests and, and actions um, that we can take on the, the state level there. And then uh, Jeff Conant from Friends of the Earth on um, tropical tropical uh, deforestation and uh, state um, state efforts to to make a difference there. So that's who you'll be hearing from. And uh, to start, uh, just a, a little bit on why forests are important um, and why we're talking about them. So um, you know, each I think a, a lot of you have probably joined because you know that we're facing a lot of challenges. Uh, each year, uh, the earth loses uh, 5 million hectares of forest, which is a land area nearly the size of Costa Rica. And in addition, even in places where we're not actually losing you know, huge swaths of forest, we are facing uh, forest degradation, um, you know, where we're uh, human human development um, is destroying uh, you know chunks of chunks of forest um, uh, integrating them forests are incredibly important we can't afford to be losing them at this rate uh, forests are crucial to slowing the speed of climate change they absorb and store carbon dioxide which I think as folks know is a greenhouse gas that contributes to global warming and when trees die, much of that carbon can be trapped indefinitely as carbon rich soil. So if we're losing our forests, we're losing some of our best natural climate solutions. Forest ecosystems are also essential to biodiversity. It's estimated that 80% of the world's land biodiversity, so wildlife that lives on land is located in forests. This is particularly true of tropical rainforests, which cover less than 10% of the planet's land, but host two thirds of the um, world's biodiversity. Uh, and even outside of the tropics, the um, boreal forests of Canada is home to billions of migratory birds and the um, forests of the United States are incredibly important to uh, many of our most iconic wildlife species. Forests are also critical to watershed health, uh, serving as natural filters for water. And forests have been important to people for as long as we've been able to walk through the forests and you know, stand under the trees. Indigenous people use them for traditional uses now, and every year millions of people camp, hike, fish, swim, or just sit under trees every year and uh, enjoy, you know, the spiritual fulfillment that comes from being near them. So incredibly important. Uh, with that, we're going to talk about what we can do on the state level to actually um, protect uh, our our trees. And we're going to start um, start with the United States. So I'm going to turn it over to Zach now. Uh, and just let me know when you want me to switch slides. Great. Thank you, Lynn. I'm honored to be on this panel and to be visiting with all of you in the audience. Thank you for uh, making time for this today. Um, you know, I'll just say that uh, as somebody who has been working on federal level, um, you know, forest management issues for about two decades now, uh, I can say that as uh, I have done more and more state level work in recent years, I've actually found a lot of reason for hope. Uh, whereas, you know, Congress has been a pretty challenging place to work. Uh, we have made incredible 
progress at the state level. And I don't think that that's limited to forests. If, you know, if any of you are paying attention to politics, as I'm sure you are, uh, state level activism on any number of issues um, has been, I think, a, a really important arena for advancing uh, policies. So really glad that you're here today and, and to be chatting with you about uh, forests. So go ahead, Len. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about four ways that state lawmakers can can leverage your unique voices and, and, and powers um, to protect forests. So yeah, next slide, please. So I want to use some concrete examples uh, as much as possible here to inspire you uh, in your neck of the woods. Just this spring in Vermont, we passed what I believe is the strongest uh, legislation uh, now on the books in, in the country uh, to advance 30 by 30 and half earth goals. The so-called Community Resilience and Biodiversity Protection Act of 2023 was championed by the amazing uh, Representative Amy Sheldon, chair of the Vermont House Committee on Environment and Energy, um, who is an a, a, a amazing champion for uh, forests. And, and this bill is remarkable in several ways. One is that it sets a statutory mandate to protect 30% of Vermont's land area from development by 2030. It sets a further goal of protecting 50% of the state's land area from development by 2050. Um, Beyond that, though, it also includes goals for not just protecting lands from development into, you know, urban and suburban growth from, uh, you know, other 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 commercial uses, but it also sets targets for the types of land management that are going to ensure that we continue to maximize the amount of carbon that is sequestered and stored in our forests, and that we are actually recovering old growth forests at a meaningful scale in these uh, in, in, in the state of Vermont. Today, we have less than a tenth of a percent of old growth in the New England region and in Vermont. Um, what a bill like this gives us the chance to do is to put on the map, where are we going to allow forests to grow old? So the bill includes a goal of managing 10% of Vermont's forest land area to grow old in the future someday, right? So this will start a process of marking out where are we going to create what are called in the bill ecological reserves, strict, strictly protected areas. Where are we going to create areas where we might allow some management to benefit biodiversity? Where are we going to facilitate sustainable uses of forest for wood products? And be really careful about what that word sustainable means, right? So. Um, the, it's a planning bill in many respects, but it includes these very substantive goals and is, a, I think, a really trend-setting piece of legislation that I hope might be replicated in other parts of the country. And I would love to talk to you more about it, um, and I can absolutely put you in touch with uh, Representative Sheldon. Go ahead to the next slide, Len. Another really important opportunity at the state level is to think about what's called rulemaking. Um, you know, statute typically, uh, in order to keep it from being too down in the weeds, um, will not get to the ground level in terms of how laws will play out, uh, on, you know, actually within our forests. Something that, um, to give the federal government some credit, that we have done better at the federal level than the state level is to develop rules that guide management actions on the ground. At the state level, uh, at least here in New England, and I'm guessing this is the case all across the country, um, rules are rare if not absent altogether for state land management. And just speaking for uh, Vermont, um, we have no rules guiding state land management. And as a result of that, there are very few ways for the public to actually hold state agencies to account. Very challenging to get transparency in state land management without binding rules that guide the development of management plans, and logging projects on the ground. So a, a really important piece of legislation that is all about transparency and accountability is simply ensuring that there are requirements for rules for how state lands are managed. And state lands can be significant, right? In, in the state of Vermont, that's 10% of Vermont's land area that is managed in, in state forests. So um, it, you know, in other states, it might even be, be more than that. So a very important opportunity for state lawmakers to 
um, in increase the public's ability to engage with the land that they own. Um, this is about putting the public back in public land management. And those rules can help us address things like managing for flood risk reduction, which is a huge issue here in Vermont. Managing to, again, maximize carbon uptake and storage and then protecting native biodiversity, et cetera. So really, really important uh, uh, opportunity. Go ahead. Something else for state lawmakers to consider is the strength of protected areas on state lands. Again, using local examples here, Vermont's strongest protections for state lands are called natural areas. Natural areas are created through administrative designation. They require approval of a governor, but they can also be undesignated simply with a governor's decision at any time. There is very little permanence for these natural areas. And as a result, what we have seen is these natural areas coming under attack. Um, Vermont has a, a huge ski industry. That ski industry continues to you know, push for more development. We had a proposal to build a gondola through a state natural area that should be protected purely for the benefit of, of the ecosystem that's there. And for the last several years, we've learned that uh, Vail Resorts, which owns uh, Stowe, a large ski resort here in Vermont, wants to build a, a ski lift through one of these state natural areas. Um, currently on, you know, on the books, this would be relatively easy for the state to make happen. And that's just not okay from the perspective of maintaining the integrity of these natural ecosystems long into the future. So in many cases, you know, their states lack strong statutes uh, that protect, you know, state land so that only a dozen states today have something equivalent to the Wilderness Act, for example, at the federal level, or something similar to that. So there are a lot of opportunities to strengthen these protections for natural areas, for state parks, for example. Most state parks, I don't think most people realize this, are open to logging in the U.S. And again, I'll just use Vermont as an example. We're cutting down our state parks right now here, here in Vermont, and it's a, it's a very sad thing to see. Go ahead. And lastly, I want to touch on ways that you as state lawmakers can make a huge difference at the federal level. So some of you may have heard that in uh, on Earth Day of 2022, President Biden uh, committed to uh, uh, signed an executive order that directs the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management at the federal level to conserve mature and old growth forests. And this launched a process to inventory and develop policies to protect mature and old growth. This is a, a process that's playing out right now as we speak. We desperately need the Forest Service to change its management of mature and old growth forests to protect them for the future. And currently, sadly, the Forest Service is slow walking its implementation of this executive order and developing the policies that are necessary to change the way things are done on the ground. And state lawmakers collectively will have a sign-on letter available very soon that Len might talk about more in a moment um, that you can sign to help raise your voice as a state lawmaker calling for stronger federal protections from the Forest Service of new rule to protect mature and old growth forests on, on federal land. So this is a, a, huge, a huge chance to take action at the federal level. So I think that's it for me. So thank you and I look forward to uh, questions. Great, thank you so much, Zach. And we'll have a chance for questions um, for all of our uh, panelists at the end. So um, let's see, I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer to talk to us about uh, global forests and specifically folk, um, specifically uh, about uh, Northern forests and what we can do in the US. Great, thank you so much, Len. And thank you to Environment America for hosting this and all of you for being here. Um, yeah, as Len mentioned, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what's happening in northern forests. It'll sort of take some of the dynamics that Zach was just talking about in the U.S. context and, and sort of talking about them at the global scale and, and what can be done to address those. Um, so if you go to the first slide. Um, so as Len already talked about up top, um, you know, forests generally are incredibly important. Um, and this is especially true in northern forests uh, for all of the reasons that um, they, they already mentioned. Uh, northern forests are among the most carbon dense terrestrial ecosystems in the world. Um, storing in Canada, the Canadian boreal forest stores twice as much carbon as the world's oil reserves. 
uh, they're home to at-risk species like caribou and lynx and billions of migratory birds. And they're, of course, the homes of uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. Uh, more than 600 indigenous communities live in the boreal forest of Canada. The Sami call the boreal forests of Scandinavia home. And of course, communities across northern forests live on and, and rely on them. And just to clarify, when I'm talking about northern forests, I'm talking about forests north of the tropics, so temperate and boreal. Um, while over the past 30 years or so across modern environmental law and policy, the international community has focused almost exclusively on deforestation in the tropics and really turned very much a blind eye to what is happening um, outside of the, the bounds of tropical forests in these northern forests. Um, and I'll talk a minute about the policy frameworks that have allowed that to happen. But if you actually look at the numbers about what's happening on the ground in these northern forests, it's quite devastating. So industrial logging in the global north, um, as you can see from this uh, chart here from WRI, is actually the single largest driver of tree cover loss in the world. If you look at the countries that have the highest rates of intact forest landscape loss, uh, you have Russia number one, Brazil, and then you know the ostensible sort of um, green leader, Canada, right there at number three. Um, Canada clear cuts more than 1.4 million acres of its forests every year uh, to feed products like toilet paper, tissue, biomass, um, and, and lumber. Sweden, uh, another country that's sort of renowned for its environmental credibility, uh, had clear cut uh, a quarter of its old growth between 2003 and 2019. And it's on track to uh, eliminate its old growth forests by I believe 2070. So it's, um, you know, the, the industry continues to erode these really climate critical areas that are truly irreplaceable. Uh, next slide, please. So a big reason why this has been allowed to happen and why it's flown so under the radar is that so much of international forest policy has focused exclusively on this term deforestation, which is narrowly defined to include the conversion of a forest to an entirely different land use. So, you know, clear cutting a forest and turning it into, into a palm oil plantation or to a cattle ranch. And Jeff will talk a lot more about the impacts um, that uh, come from, from tropical deforestation. But what that uh, lets off the hook is the industry that is the predominant industry in the global north, which is industrial logging, which you um, the the legal fiction that exists is that you can clear cut a forest. Uh, it can look like the image that you're seeing here, um, you know, no trees remaining in that area. But because the intent is to allow trees to regrow in that area or to replant the trees, it's still considered a forest and not just a forest, but, uh, you know, Canadian um, industry and, and uh, officials will tell you it's a healthy forest. And so when Canada clear cuts more than 1.4 million acres of its forest each year, it can actually claim to have near zero deforestation. And that is the image that it presents to the world. And then of course filters into you know the marketplace and decision-making there. Um, instead, the, uh, the more relevant term when it comes to industrial logging is this term uh, degradation, which does have longstanding purchase in global forest policy, but again, due to the influence of uh, countries in the global north has largely stayed out of their own backyards. Um, but this captures broader loss of ecosystem value that comes from industrial logging. So when you clear cut something like a primary forest, which is a, a forest that's never been previously industrially disturbed, or clear cut an old growth forest, um, like Zach was talking about, these are forests that are irreplaceable on any meaningful human time scale. They have unique value for the climate, for biodiversity, for uh, ecosystem services like water filtration for communities um, and simply allowing them to regrow or replanting these areas doesn't um, doesn't bring them back. Um, so degradation is the more relevant term talking about that that larger loss. Uh, next slide please. And so what uh, policymakers can do including and especially at the state level 
is start building in some of these terms and protections that would apply to industrial logging in the global north, in addition to uh, tropical deforestation and impacts there. Um, fortunately, in the last couple of years in particular, there's been really unprecedented attention to the impacts of what's happening in the global north and the impacts of degradation. Just earlier this year, the EU implemented the, uh, the EU deforestation regulation, which prohibits trade that is tied to uh, products tied to deforestation or forest degradation, defined in a way that clearly applies to many industrial logging practices in, in Canada and elsewhere across the global north. Um, the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest and Land Use uh, uh, requires signatories to halt and reverse deforestation and land degradation by 2030. Um, as Jeff well knows, uh, there's been increased marketplace attention to the impact of forest degradation. So in 2020 and then in 2022, P&G and Home Depot shareholders respectively um, overwhelmingly passed resolutions calling on the company to report on what they could do to address deforestation and degradation across their tropical and boreal supply chains. Um, and so this really creates a, a very critical and, and unique moment for states to build on this momentum and, of course, also the growing marketplace scrutiny and, and marketplace need to adapt to these changing dynamics. So some of the things that uh, we've been working on and that there's a whole lot more room for growth around are things like procurement measures. So Jeff will go m m far more into this, but, um, you know, is your state... Uh, ensuring that the products it's purchasing are not tied to deforestation or forest degradation. Things like disclosure policies. So companies in many cases aren't reporting what kind of impacts they're having on the ground, um, requiring companies to disclose their impacts on nature in the tropics and in the north. Um, things like resolutions, recognizing the importance of northern forests and the importance of developing supply chains and policies that ensure their protection right alongside the tropics. And things like studies, because uh, counterintuitively, there's actually a whole lot more known about tropical deforestation than there is about degradation in the global north because of how policy has played out. So, you know, Canada, for example, doesn't really even know where its primary forests still are or where that um, logging is, is intersecting with them. So there's a whole menu of options. Um, there's you know, far more beyond even this list and encourage you to build on the momentum that's been happening and, uh, and, and engage with these policy opportunities uh, in this unique moment. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff now to um, talk about tropical deforestation and uh, specifically some work uh, that a lot of groups, in, in, including all of us, or most of us on this call, have been uh, supporting in New York. Okay, yeah, thank you, uh, Lynn, and thanks to Environment America and everybody um, here for um, for the concern about this issue. Um, I'm, I prepared just a few slides specifically about the New York Tropical Deforestation Free Procurement Act, and we'll go into some detail about this piece of legislation um, that is sitting on the governor's desk in the state of New York. Um, but before I do, I'm realizing um, I didn't prepare any slide material that, that sort of talks a little bit more in depth about some of the issues in tropical forests. So I'll just take a minute there to share some perspective, um, which is to essentially say, I mean, some of this I think is going to be somewhat self-evident, but um, coming from Jen talking about the incredible value of, of Northern forests, tropical forests are the world's greatest repositories of terrestrial biodiversity. As you can imagine, we're talking about forests that are home to great apes, to, you know, Sumatran rhinos, to, the migratory birds that are coming from Canada to the tropics. Um, we're talking about, you know, and we're facing a major, um, the, the sixth major extinction of biodiversity across the world and tropical forests and preserving tropical forests is really one of the major keys to preventing the loss of species. Um, so biodiversity is major. Um, but another piece uh, that is really critical when we think about tropical forests uh, that might not be intuitive uh, for a lot of folks is that in the tropics in particular and throughout the global south, 
<clears throat> deforestation and forest degradation are inseparable from abuses of indigenous people's rights and the rights of other forest dwelling communities. Of course, there are still millions of, um, of indigenous peoples living in the world's forests from Southeast Asia to Latin America to Africa. Um, and in order to get to those forests, the, the by and large corporations, but also states that are abusing those forests uh, first need to get to the land. And that's where we talk a lot about what we call land grabbing. Um, and right now, across the world, there's an epidemic of violence against environmental human rights defenders, uh, meaning the people who are simply defending their lands and their livelihoods. Um, every two days, an environmental human rights defender is murdered. Um, across the tropics in countries like Brazil, Colombia, the Philippines, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Indonesia. Um, and uh, the second greatest driver of this violence is agribusiness, industrial agriculture, um, and agribusiness, namely what we call forest risk commodities, uh, which includes palm oil, soy, cattle, timber, paper, cocoa, and a few others, are the primary drivers of tropical deforestation. So when we talk about what is causing tropical deforestation, it's these six products or these six commodities, and they are also the industries that are driving this epidemic of attacks on human rights defenders. Um, and um, these commodities, soy, beef, palm oil, coffee, cocoa, wood pulp paper, are, of course, imported in massive quantities to the US and around the world for use in products that we use every day from, you know, from uh, our hamburgers to our donuts to our toothpaste uh, to our office paper. Um, and that gets us to the New York Tropical Deforestation Free Procurement Act. This is a bill um, that is uh, was introduced in the New York State Legislature by Senator Liz Krueger and Assemblyman Zabrowski um, earlier this year. And throughout 2023, um, the bill has won with bipartisan support in both chambers, and it's now waiting on the governor's signature to be signed into law. She has until December 31st uh, to sign it into law. The bill will effectively tighten an existing state ban on the use of tropical hardwoods for government projects. I'll go a little more deeply into that. It will require state contractors who deal in forest risk products to certify that their products don't drive deforestation, forest degradation, or human rights abuses. Um, it Again, it defines forest risk commodities to include soy, beef, palm oil, coffee, cocoa, wood pulp, paper, and wood products with other commodities to be considered over time. It gives a bidding preference to small, medium-sized, and minority and women-owned businesses. Um, it will create a supply chain transparency assistance program for companies, businesses that are uh, dealing in forest risk products, essentially to make it easier for businesses in New York to green their supply chains. Um, the bill, uh, once it becomes law, will have a stakeholder advisory group to oversee implementation, which will include representatives from business and civil society, as well as representatives from indigenous tropical communities. Um, the bill has very strong support from responsible investors, from the faith community, uh, from the B Corps community, because it's a business friendly bill. Um, and um, I think the 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 really the grounding of it i mean as jen mentioned that word procurement um is is really key new york state is the 10th largest economy in the world purchases hundreds of millions of dollars worth of products every year and so the idea is to use the state's economic leverage to drive sustainability down supply chains um and so it's not a bill that will simply protect new york state um from sort of exposure to the problems associated with deforestation um, in the tropics, it will actually require companies to change their practices. Um, so it'll have far reaching implications. It's very much in line with the EU deforestation regulation um, that was mentioned previously as well. Um, and I would be remiss uh, after Jen's talk about the critical nature of temperate and, and boreal forests 
Not to mention uh, that the bill was initially introduced to also address boreal forest um, degradation and deforestation. But um, unfortunately, uh, one of the major boreal countries, which happens to lie just to the north of New York, um, put a lot of political um, capital behind getting boreal forests out of this bill. So um, we absolutely believe in protecting all forests, and this bill is limited to tropical uh, forests, essentially for political expediency. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. And uh, just to drill down a little bit um, on one of the shocking things that I've learned in, in advancing this bill is that to this day in New York City, a lot of the boardwalks, the marine pilings, the uh, railroad ties are made with virgin timber imported from Brazil and from West Africa and from across the tropics. Um, and we've met um, with the MTA in New York who have agreed with us that this is absurd. There's no reason in 2021 with the climate emergency we're facing that the state of New York should be you know, making anything out of uh, virgin tropical timber. Uh, so that's just one aspect of the bill and I, I wanted to share that piece. Um, I think I have one more slide here. Um, yeah, the, uh, the origin of this, um, the, the action leading to this bill actually goes back to California where back in about 2018, uh, we worked with an assembly member in California to introduce the California Tropical Deforestation Free Procurement Act. Um, that bill won uh, with bipartisan support in both chambers, um, but Governor Newsom there vetoed it in 2020, asking us to bring it back uh, with a more business friendly aspect, which is actually part of the um, part of the. Um, the origin of the of the incentives in the New York bill. Um, when we were promoting that bill in California, we did a study that showed that up to 25% of state procurement in California may be at risk of exposure to or driving tropical deforestation. And the action that's happened this year there is that there was a legislative um, order to audit uh, California's procurement um, and we're waiting for that to come back from the California um, Legislative Audit uh, Commission or committee. Um, and how that comes back may determine whether or not the bill is reintroduced into California in 2024. Um, we're really hopeful that Governor Hochul in New York will sign the New York version. And if we win in New York, we'll win in California. There's interest in a lot of other states. Hopefully some of you listening from other states will uh, consider taking uh, taking this template and moving it ahead in your states. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, so we now want to open it up for um, questions uh, from the audience for any, um, any and all of our uh, panelists. You can use the Q&A feature down at the bottom, um, or you can also um, raise your hand and I can unmute you if you prefer uh, to ask your question. <clears throat> so we'll give folks a couple minutes <laughs> to have thoughts percolate, but um, any questions for any of us? All right, we've got two. Oh. There was a hand up, but I lost it. <laughs> um, anyone who wants to ask a question, again, you can use the Q. Okay, here we go. Um, great. Go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, I. From the screen here, I can't quite tell what's going on, but um, we can we can hear you. <laughs> great. Okay, now I see some faces. That's great. Um, Rachel Smolker, I'm a co-director of Biofuel Watch. I'm also you know, very close with Zach here in Vermont and <laughs> Standing Trees. Uh, and Jeff, hey, I know Jeff from way back. Um, so I have a couple of questions um, and I'm just gonna sort of throw them out there really quickly. One of them is with respect to the, um, the uh, procurement um, regulation, certification has always been a problem. For, and especially with forest products and forest practices because nobody's out there with their boots actually making sure and it's just so damn easy to game 
the certification process. And I'm just wondering, you know, if you might take a moment to talk about that. But that's one question. Uh, another question I have about that also is uh, if there's concern about how trade law could come into play in uh, creating hurdles for those kinds of procurement regulations. So that's question number two. Uh, sorry, yeah, you can throw any of these away if you want, if you don't want to answer them. But the other one is about just sort of the, the uh, you know, as uh, working with Biofuel Watch, just um, seeing, scanning the horizon of uh, demand for wood, not just for biomass energy, which is people have become a lot more familiar with, but wood as an alternative to construction material, wood as a source of biomass for making alternative plastics, alternative chemicals, alternative everything out of wood. Uh, and as a driver of deforestation, this whole bioeconomy and the you know, climate solution of using wood um, is a juggernaut of proportion that's really, really alarming. Uh, and I don't know if that's a question so much as a perspective. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, let's see. I think for your first two questions, um, think well, probably anyone, but um, Jeff, can I kick over to you to um, take a first stab and then you want to kick it over to Jennifer um, after that? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I will hopefully rely on Jennifer to fill in anything that I, I miss. Um, thank you, Rachel. Great questions. Um, and the, the least the first one is is somewhat fraught. Um, but yeah, certification industry led certification schemes like the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, uh, FSC, SFI for for wood and paper are historically, you know, they they tend to serve to undermine um, real sustainability goals and serve um, industry's interest uh, to to greenwash their products. And uh, with the New York bill and the California bill before that, the advocates pushing these bills have very clearly um, worked to uh, exclude the use of those industry-led certification schemes um, in the bills so they don't rely on those schemes. Um, but that brings a whole other set of problems. What? How do we verify that you know companies are in compliance? And the way it works in the New York bill is uh, this is gonna gonna scare you but it's self-certification by companies but we're hopeful that because of the way the bill language works basically any company that is selling to new york um, products that are associated with tropical deforestation has to show that it can trace its entire supply chain to the point of origin, so that to the smallest geographic unit is the language of the bill, so to the ranch or to the plantation, and they have to have in place policies, you know, no deforestation policies and uh, no degradation, no exploitation of peatlands, um, and a whole range of policies that they have to, the companies have to have on the books, and um, because of that supply chain traceability requirement, basically that's linked also to a grievance hotline where civil society or anybody can file a complaint with the state to say that the company, you know, any company is not complying with the law. So when we say self-certification, we're not just saying companies can say whatever they want. We're saying companies have to have complete supply chain transparency and basically the burden of proof is uh, is on them. Um, and there's a complaints mechanism. So we're, we're hopeful that it's the right way to go. Um, in terms of trade law, curiously, because this bill, I mean, I'm not a lawyer or a trade lawyer, much less, but it's not about commerce. It's about state purchasing. Um, and the bill doesn't, aside from tropical hardwoods, which I'll say a little bit about, it doesn't actually ban anything. It just puts in place certain uh, requirements, which many companies already claim to be doing. So um, there's a certain defense build in, built in there in, in that many of the companies, the multinationals that we're talking about to whom the bill will apply, already claim to be doing, you know, having practices and policies that are in compliance. So they will be loath to uh, launch trade, um, you know, cases. But in any case, the state 
is able, you know, can purchase what it wants and what it doesn't want. Bidding, you know, bidding preferences, contracting, that is apparently not governed by uh, by trade law. So we don't have any concerns there. Um, but just to wrap up on the tropical hardwood piece, tropical hardwoods are banned. So that's the only thing that's actually banned under the bill. Um, and to the certification point, curiously, there are some environmental groups uh, who are not behind this bill because they believe that um, it undermines sustainable uh, certification of tropical hardwoods um, and that uh, that sets a, a bad precedent. Um, and what we're saying is any entity like any state should be able to, you know, it, we're not banning the the. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're not banning, you know, clear cutting tropical forests for virgin timber. We're just saying the New York state as one consumer chooses not to purchase that product. Um, um, but nonetheless, there are some environmental groups out there who would prefer to use sustainability certifications uh, for tropical hardwood. Um, so we're being quite assiduous about uh, resisting that. Um, Jen, I don't know if the, that was quite wordy. Um, Jen, I don't know if you want to weigh in. Yeah, I can jump in on maybe two of those points. So on the certification question, um, and they were all really good questions. So thank you for those. You know, how certification has been deeply problematic in northern the context of northern forests, because it has been one of the shields with which countries like Canada have, you know, obscured attention on the actual impacts of their forests. So for example, um, Jeff obliquely um, and uh, diplomatically mentioned that there was a country that opposed the New York uh, deforestation, uh, tropical deforestation Pre -Pre procurement act uh, when it included the boreal. Um, yes, that was uh, obviously Canada. They did the same thing in California and successfully had the boreal uh, excised from that bill as well. And in their outreach to policymakers, one of their main arguments is, oh, nearly all of our forests are certi uh, certified. We have the most robust certification schemes in the world. Um, when in fact, you know, most of those certification systems are not outcome oriented. They, they have actually very few meaningful protections for uh, climate, for biodiversity, for indigenous rights. I will say not all four certifications are created equal and some are the, much better than others. Um, the only one in the Canadian, the sort of Northern wood products context that really has any credibility is FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council. And that does meaningfully uh, move the needle in terms of enshrining these protections. But Canada tends to, and many other countries tend to treat them all as, as equal and sort of uh, creating this race to the bottom, which is very problematic in terms of how they're implemented. Um, and also FSC was never meant to exist in a vacuum, a regulatory vacuum, and that's sort of what ended up happening. Um, I'll also add on the certification question, I think there's increasing recognition within policy that certification itself is not a substitute for due diligence. So this is the case in the New York bill that, that Jeff mentioned. Um, the EUDR does not allow certification to be sort of a de facto guarantee that the product is, is sustainably sourced. Um, same with there's been recent OECD, FAO guidance that also speaks to this, that companies need to have their own internal due diligence processes. And, um, you know, this is really important for moving away from the existing paradigm, but also, as Jeff mentioned, really elevates the need for creating tools and processes for figuring out what's happening on the ground and companies need to be investing in these kinds of technologies to allow them to see what's happening. And this is cer certainly true in the Northern forest context, where, as I mentioned, data has been pretty um, scarce due to uh, sort of government's failure to actually look into what is happening or disclose what is happening on the ground. Um, on that disclosure question and on the transparency question, one thing I will flag just because it's sort of coming up is um, we've been working to advance a Glasgow Declaration Accountability Framework, which would apply globally um, and enshrine different tools and processes like transparency and reporting and enhanced monitoring and common standards that would hold all countries to the same standard, getting away from this global inequity between expectations between the tropics and the global north, and also encourage and, and incentivize progress towards greater data collection. 
um, if you're interested, I can paste in the chat in a minute uh, a, a brief that we have um, so you can learn more on that. And the one other thing that you on the bioeconomy is, yeah, forests have for a very long time and only more so today become a get out of jail free card for so many different aspects of, um, you know, nature destruction and, and climate change. And a lot of this is grounded in the myths that pervade what is actually happening in our forest. So if Canada is saying, you know, we don't deforest, everything that's coming out of here is going to regrow and it's fine. Of course, that seems like a great substitute for concrete and steel and, you know, other, you know, plastics and whatnot. Um, so this really emphasizes the need for policymakers to actually enshrine protections that are going to ensure that only products that are actually sustainably sourced are coming out of uh, these northern forests and, and tropical forests and that practices on the ground are abiding by the highest standards of sustainability so that to the extent that yes in some cases there might be um, it might be appropriate to substitute uh, certain bioeconomy products for for other materials but only if those are met with sort of the high standards that that need to be there that they are sort of matched with the data needed to guarantee that they are sustainably sourced and that everyone is sort of working from a sign, uh, baseline of scientific integrity on this question. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, and then Lee has a question in the Q&A, which is, does N NRDC have anything like what Jeff is talking about for states regarding boreal forest products from Canada? Um, well, I think I can, sort of quickly say the, and these are our bills that Environment America also has supported. Um, in both New York and California, the original intent was to include the boreal. And as as um, Jeff and Jennifer just described it, um, the boreal was dropped uh, in, in both cases because of lobbying on the part of the Canadian government. So we we would love to have a bill <laughs> that included all of the above. Um, all right, any other questions? Um, folks can either raise their hand or throw into the Q&A. And while we're waiting, maybe I'll just jump in to add a tiny Please bit do. to that, which is that, you know, if I'm the one mainly talking about the New York bill, but it's a, the bill is supported by NRDC, by Environmental America, by, you know, we've got a, a letter from over 50 national and, and New York state environmental groups who are behind the bill. Um, so there's a, there's a, I would say a really robust um, consensus among a lot of the environmental groups right now that uh, these kind of state bills are, you know, as Zach noted earlier, are really critical and are, yeah, a critical pathway to protecting forests globally and, and locally. So not just one NGO behind any of these, it's where there's a lot of unity. And just speaking for, you know, NRDC support of the New York bill, one of the reasons, there's so many reasons to love this bill, but one of the reasons is that even though the boreal is no longer in there, it preserves a lot of the language and the structures that are really needed to capture the dynamics um, around industrial logging in the global north. So it still contains language around degradation of primary forests and starting to socialize the need to be looking at things from that forest integrity angle. And so, you know, don't tell Canada, but this could very easily like be, be applied from a more global perspective. And it, it really starts to lay the groundwork for that more equitable global framework. Last call for questions from the audience. Um, so we will send out to everybody on this call and then also everyone that RSVP to follow up with um, contact information for all of the speakers um, and then also um, some some links um, so that folks can follow up. But definitely encourage um, everyone who's on to follow up with us <laughs> um, and, you know, ask questions. Um, we're excited. We'd, we'd love to see more states, um, you know moving forward any any of these uh these policies so um any final call final call for questions from anyone you can raise your hand or ask in the q a oh here we go excellent uh doris you should be able to unmute and ask your question can you hear me Yes. Okay. I live in Oregon. 
we have a, a serious um, forest problem with um, the uh, interest in biofuels from forest residues. And um, I have worked with um, IUCN and other people on um, some of these uh, impacts on communities in other countries. But we're going to be seeing these biofuels issues hitting communities in the United States where um, the uh, it's it, I guess people just need more education about uh, Sierra Club other groups try to explain that burning this burning wood is not sustainable. It's not a good substitute for fossil fuels. But the fossil fuel industry continues to say anything is better than fossil fuels. So I encourage you um, and also thank you uh, for what you do today, but I encourage you to um, maybe give, give states more help on biofuels. And um, that, that was my last thought. Thank you. I can, I can jump in on that one, Len. Um, so Doris, thank you so much for bringing that up. And, and, you know, I, I didn't, I kind of steered away from biofuels, but not for any good reason in, in the comments that I made earlier. Um, as you are probably dealing with an organ, although I'm not familiar with that state's policies, but in, 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 in most of the world today, we consider, uh, in, in, you know, formally in terms of our greenhouse gas accounting, we're still considering, you know, biogenic uh, you know, carbon emissions to be neutral in the scheme of things that the trees will just grow back someday and therefore there's nothing to worry about. Um, and that's absolutely the case in New England, um, you know, where I work, uh, it's the case in most places. And uh, this facilitates our, you know, uh, continued, or I should say the, the, the biomass industry's continued deception of uh, the American public and, and the public worldwide. Um, and you know, it's absolutely a critical issue that state lawmakers can have a major uh, effect on here in Vermont, for example, and like in many other states, we're, we've gone through a climate action planning process and we're developing carbon budgets and we're required to promulgate rules as a state, which has not happened in the 10 years since it was legislatively mandated that uh, formalize our greenhouse gas accounting protocol. And uh, those protocols should treat biomass appropriately, right? It should treat wood burning um, as a significant source of carbon emissions. And uh, by doing that accurate accounting, we can start to, you know, have a, a, a real conversation about what the impacts are instead of talking past each other, as uh, happens so often in these discussions. And, uh, you know, it could absolutely help to, you know, dealing with these issues I won't speak to exactly what the policy solutions are, but you know, of course, um, there are certain states uh, that are exporting tremendous amounts of you know wood, woody biomass for uh, burning elsewhere. Like for example, all across the southeast and the export to uh, to Europe. And so there is much that can be done, I think, at the state level um, around you know carbon accounting uh, to help get at that greenwashing that the biomass industry practices. Um, I'm sure the others here have, will have other other ideas too, but that's that's a really important opportunity. Um, all right, we've got another. Well, sorry, if Jeff or um, John, if you wanted to add on, we also have a, another question. Um, I would just say I think we're all in agreement there, but uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Anne, go ahead. Thank you, um, Ann Wickman, relatively new to Oregon, but now I live in Oregon. And um, I was a park ranger in Colorado and I am, let's just say horrified at Oregon's forest management policies. And the thing I'm finding is that our policies are unduly influenced by um, large, logging corporations like Weyerhaeuser and beyond. And it seems it's in, in impacting even Oregon State U University and 
to me, um, places that should do a better job of understanding the biodiversity of forests and the the um, just complexity of it. So it's all about revenue here. And I'm just wondering if you guys have any thoughts about how to move that needle a little bit, because they're really turning Oregon into a tree farm. And and it it adds a little bit to the last speaker's question in that a tree farm burns really hot, <laughs> whereas an old forest has a lot more protective mechanisms with wildfires. So we're um, always encountering that the trees will grow back, the forest will not grow back because they're putting everything into rotation. So save me from my grief. Mm. I'm on the East Coast now, but I was West Coast uh, until recently. And yeah, the forests of Oregon and California are facing, you know, a, a major disaster. One thing I want to share, I mean, one, in Oregon, there's a tremendous popular history of forest defense, um, which has suffered from tremendous repression and suppression. Um, but there are some, you know, great frontline forest defenders out there. And I would just... Uh, you know, say, support them. But there was a study done some years ago in Oregon, um, or well, a, a, an organization looked at how, at the carbon accounting in Oregon's forests. And um, Oregon claims that its forests are carbon uh, neutral or carbon negative with no actual study. And as we know, just from the burning of the forest, let alone from the conversion from natural forest to plantations, Oregon's forests are actually a carbon source, not a carbon sink. So just like with the biomass issue that Zach pointed to, um, the idea that uh, basically we need to revamp um, the way carbon accounting is done in Oregon and so many other states um, and recognize that we can't just take the industry line that forests are forests, therefore they're sequestering carbon because it ain't true. Well, and in terms that was, you know, very well said, and, and thank you for raising that. In, in terms of what states can do on this question, this is also where states that don't necessarily have their own, um, you know, large forest ecosystems can can step in and really help to shift the marketplace and set new standards for sustainable sourcing. So, you know, no matter whether, you know, you're, you're talking about a state like Oregon or you're talking about a state like, um, you know, I don't know, uh, Illinois, um, that, that may not have as robust a, a, a logging industry, there's so much that policymakers can do to set standards around their own purchases of these products, to set standards around corporate disclosures of their impacts that will then have ripple effects across the marketplace and really help to move the needle. Um, because you're absolutely right, you know, industry capture of government is tremendous. It's, it's in Oregon, it's rampant in Canada. Um, and uh, you know across sort of uh, these these different jurisdictions, and so the more that we can do externally to also build in these protections and build this marketplace pressure through both policy and the marketplace, uh, the more untenable business as usual is going to be, and the more we'll be able to shift things to a more uh, to a safer, more sustainable future. And yeah, I mean just to add a little bit more. You know, uh, to me, this is, you know, the reason why we need to double down on public land protections. Um, you know, if there is anywhere where we should set an example for uh, putting forests on a different path, it's public forests. And uh, that's why, you know, at Standing Trees, we're working very closely with Environment America and NRDC, um, among many others, on this quote unquote, climate forest campaign um, to establish a nationwide rule that would protect mature and old growth forests from logging and allow us to recover those old growth ecosystems at a, at a vast scale. We're talking 50 plus million acres of one third of the national forest system that is mature or old growth forest. And you know much much of that, most of that unprotected currently from logging. There's only so much impact that we can have and oftentimes indirect uh, on private timberlands. And so, you know, today, private lands supply 96% of the timber supply 
uh, that's consumed here in the US, right? So public lands are not a major source of timber, but we continue to abuse them on rotation and keep them in an artificially young state. And, and that forest degradation over many years, you know, is keeping them from doing what we need forests to do for ecosystem services, you know, for biodiversity. Um, so at a huge scale, we can make a, an enormous difference with, with, you know, federal public lands across the country. Um, and you know, for the first time, if we if we took such a measure, we could actually stand on the global stage and speak from real a, a place of real credibility compared to our current pretty empty asks of the rest of the globe when we can't even figure out how to treat our own forests well here in this country. So, um, you know, our focus at Standing Trees is first and foremost on public land protection. And, and that's why these are our lands. They should be serving the public good and the public interest. And that means something in 2023 that perhaps it didn't a hundred years ago when we didn't have a, as good an understanding of, of the science. And we really have no excuses at this point not to put these forests on a different path. Well said, Zach. Um, and I think with that, we're at time. Um, and that uh, seems like an excellent note um, to uh, to end on. So again, thank you so much. Uh, we'll send out a follow-up email with uh, links to some of these resources. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, I learn something new every time <laughs> I we host one of these, even though I talk about forests every day. So uh, thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day. Thanks.